Thank you everyone uh, for joining us today um, as part of the uh, Stride Center webinar series. My name is Kweku Brown um, and I am an associate professor um, here at the Citadel in the Civil and Construction Engineering Department. And I'll be presenting with Dr. Jeff Davis, who is a professor and uh, a department head, the department head of civil and construction um, engineering at the Citadel. Um, our research uh, looked to evaluate travel routes uh, and trip characteristics for e-bikes and e-scooter systems. So this project is a STRIDE funded project and uh, we would like to acknowledge the great uh, work uh, that the STRIDE Center is doing uh, here at the Citadel. Uh, we are proud to be part of the STRIDE Center and we are always excited um, at the opportunity to partner with uh, such uh, great schools uh, in the Southeast, uh, all part of the STRIDE Center. Uh, speaking of uh, working with uh, great colleagues and schools, uh, we had a great list of uh, PIs and co-PIs and researchers on this project. Uh, Dr. Kerry Watkins from Georgia Tech, um, Dr. Morgan Huey from College of Charleston, uh, myself, uh, Dr. Jeff Davis, as um, introduced already. Um, other researchers were Dr. Dimitra Mikolakov from the Citadel, Dr. Dan Bornstein, uh, formerly of the Citadel, and um, graduate researchers uh, Safa Amar Amari and uh, Jennifer Seller. Safa from Georgia Tech and uh, Jennifer from uh, the College of Charleston. I'm just going to pass it over to Jeff uh, to give us some uh, background in the project. Yeah, and then one thing about the people, the team that we had uh, for this uh, project was a, a combination of kind of transportation engineering, city planning, and also public health physical activity specialists. So that uh, really made an interesting team with many different perspectives. And uh, we all know that uh, the mobility as a service, MOS, uh, micro mobility systems are uh, pervasive throughout the United States now. And so we had the study to uh, particularly look at e-bikes and e-scooters in comparison to bike share systems, and specifically with regard to being able to accommodate short distance trips, uh, the number of trips and, and uh, the, to be taken kind of out of the, the road network and to uh, act as a, a capacity uh, mitigation uh, uh, remedy to some of the congestion we're experiencing in many of our cities. And there's lots of benefits from using active transportation listed there. And uh, we just wanted to see what is the potential of, of these modes uh, to accommodate short trips? What are the differences, particularly between e-bikes and e-scooters? And also when we put these systems in cities, how well do, does the existing street network accommodate these types of modes with the, the street networks primarily designed for automobiles? So this is kind of the background and the motiv motivation for the study. And then our research objectives on the next slide um, are to look at the trip characteristics of e-bikes and e-scooters and to see uh, the, the potential for meeting short distance travel demand, to look at the trip patterns and to look at the, the, their use of the roadway network and then also to evaluate physical activity. So as we begin to talk about e-bikes, which are very pervasive now, um, to see, well, are we, how much do we give up in terms of physical activity by having an e-bike now over a regular bicycle? So um, the, we looked for places. We had a partnership with a, a mobility provider, micro mobility provider. It was a gotcha powered by Bolt. And we looked for locations. We went through quite a vetting process to find where both systems were being used, e-bikes and e-scooters. And we came up with uh, uh, the timing and all led us to choose two project study locations, one in Birmingham, Alabama, and the other in Mobile, Alabama. And so if we look at those communities, just like, are they comparable? Uh, we looked at the demographics, the, the size of the city, the uh, elevation. The, the, probably the primary difference is the Mobile is a coastal city 
and Birmingham is uh, has some hills, has some significant hills, but the, the operation of the bike share was primarily in a relatively flat area of the downtown. Both have similar hot days, cold days, similar precipitation, and they both have universities uh, and have uh, you know considerable tourism as well. So uh, we felt uh, in our evaluation of these two cities that they were comparable, and so we moved forward with our study. And we look at the system parameters. Both systems were both operated by Gotcha powered by Bolt. They uh, see the launch dates. They involve e-bikes and e-scooters. Actually, there was way more e-scooter use is what we found out. Uh, they had similar pricing schemes. Uh, one thing that was uh, that was in Birmingham, there was a competing system that we didn't study. So that so they uh, in Mobile, it was the primary uh, micro mobility system. So it had heavier use as a result of that. So the biggest driver for uh, this research was being able to get access to data and uh, being able to just spatially or spatially see what was going on uh, with the data and uh, with the trip making characteristics. So uh, the first thing we're looking at, we're um, getting the GPS locations of each trip, um, some of the data in that data set or the characteristics of that data set were, um, or the attributes were the start and end times um, and then start and end locations, obviously, um, as well. Uh, these were used to calculate uh, trip lengths eventually. Um, and and I'll, I'll show you some examples through the slides. Um, and um, we're able to uh, assign these trips to individual uh, road segments because you wanted to see the usage of the road network. Uh, from an e-bike and e-scooter standpoint. Um, the level of traffic stress, which is um, has been used um, in or not in conjunction, but um, some other professors have used level of um, bike level of service um, in some cases, but we're kind of using level of traffic stress in this case. Uh, we also looked at um, the, the patents after we kind of got all the, the data in um, and also created all the routes and um, also looked at based on where people were riding on which types of roads and which stress levels they were in um, and also looked at different characteristics for, for e-bikes and e-scooter trips uh, overall. So uh, speaking of level of traffic stress in the previous slide, uh, this is kind of how it's uh, broken down. Uh, the main contributors to this metric are uh, the traffic volumes, um, which would be in AADTs, uh, the speeds, uh, prevailing speeds on the roadways, um, and the number of lanes. So as you can see that the level of traffic stress grows from say a very walkable, um, complete street kind of design um, to a, a major uh, thoroughfare where you have five lanes, uh, with, four lanes um, with a turn lane, for example, um, where you have bicyclists and um, other modes competing directly with uh, vehicles. Right. So moving forward in our methodology, uh, here are some examples of what it looked like in uh, on the ground. So we basically got GPS points for each trip and then these GPS points where um, we're in sequence, uh, obviously in time. So those were kind of used to create these routes um, as um, from the start point to the end point of each session um, in the Bikeser um, trip. The level of traffic stress was also used and coded to each, uh, to the road network. So um, the levels were one through four, uh, zero, obviously it was also preferable. Um, and it makes sense that the, the major highways and the interstates would be LTS4, as you can see from the graphic. Those are those in red, uh, uh, kind of those in the middle uh, would be an interstate. And then more of the local roads uh, would be the LTS1s, where it will be more favorable to uh, riding uh, bikes and uh, scooters. Moving forward with the methodology, the next thing we did after we got the routes, kind of looked at the LTS levels for the roads, uh, were to aggregate the individual trips 
to the links on the roadway because we wanted to see where people are actually riding and not just the total number of rides. So um, this is a graduated symbol map um, in GIS uh, showing where people are riding. So the thicker the lines, the more trips or the more passes of bikes or, or scooters uh, on uh, those, those links. So again, uh, looking at the two study areas, I've kind of seen the extent of usage um, of the uh, bikes and scooters, uh, kind of seeing uh, how kind of spread out they were or not, uh, kind of looking at the different terrains. And Jeff are, are already uh, talked about how comparable they might have been from the start point where we're looking at them. So uh, depending on the, the system that was in place, you kind of see the different patterns um, in usage. I'm just going to pass it over uh, to Jeff to kind of keep us going. With the we, uh, we received this data out of their uh, dashboards that we had access to, and we also downloaded those GPS routes out of the dashboards to analyze. So we studied a period in 2021, basically, it included a little bit of July and December, but basically a four-month period extending from August to November of 2021, and those were our Compare, comparable periods. And this just shows the number of users. So definitely there was more use in Mobile. And the next uh, slide shows the number of trips made by those users. And again, really concentrating in a four month period of, uh, of these uh, uh, use of both e-bikes and e-scooters, but e-scooters were way more prevalent. And so now we plot the routes. So we extract the routes, we go through a lot of QA, to associate those GPS points at one second intervals, and then to make routes to where we can then look at what roads they're uh, operating on. And in this case, we're using that uh, level of traffic stress. And so when we looked at where they were operating for in the next slide, the, um, uh, the one on the, for Birmingham, for bikes, we see they're in the blue. So that's primarily uh, traffic level stress one, a, a, a good street to ride on. and uh, a relatively small proportion of the other three levels. For scooters, we see that 83% uh, uh, of the use of the e-scooters were on roads that were uh, le traffic level of stress three and four, which was really uh, kind of surprising. And I think, you know, the Quaku can show how, where they were operating. They were many, many, uh, many times on the sidewalks. Yes, yeah, so uh, to support that finding, um, in that graph, uh, you would see uh, here on this slide uh, where you'd have an e-scooter trip kind of coming uh, south, uh, kind of, and, and then turning uh, towards the uh, the east. Um, but then you see that the route um, it's not on a road, and we are thankful for more precise GPS data these days that we can actually have confidence in saying that they're not on the roadway, but there's a kind of a sidewalk that they're on and then they cross the street and go onto the other sidewalk. Um, and, and the road that they kind of joined, it's, a, it's an LTS4 road, meaning that uh, in our data, it would say that they're on a high stress road, but they might actually be on the sidewalk. Uh, that's a, um, the next slide is another example of this where you'd have, um, from a quoting standpoint, it might be on a high stress road, but then they actually ride on the sidewalk, which could be a benefit or it is benefit, for example, to pedestrians who might be using the sidewalk. So uh, I'm not sure about if it's legal or not. Uh, Jeff might have some more insight into that when it comes to um, uh, Birmingham. So uh, I'll probably let him chime in when, when it gets to that time. Um, so uh, looking at uh, Mobile, here's kind of the distribution of trips again. The, um, the e-bike usage was minimal. But uh, the scooter usage, as you can see, is kind of spread out, uh, mostly in the downtown area, but kind of a lot of usage on the outsides as well. Um, so that's what's kind of the main pattern. Uh, similar to the Birmingham uh, data, we kind of created these graphs. However, um, with e-scooters in a mobile, not too many were on the LTS 3s and 4s, similar percentage as the bikes. Um, so almost 80% of the trips were on low LTS roads, either one or two, uh, compared to maybe 80% um, on the threes and fours or high LTS 
roads in the uh, Birmingham e-scooter trip patents. We're going to pass over to Jeff to kind of um, finish up these slides on um, on Birmingham. Yeah, so this just shows that we began to look at like, well, how far are the trips and, and how does the trip distribute? So in Birmingham, about 20% of the trips are made by bikes, or conversely, 80% by e-scooters. And then we, because we had the GPS tracking, we could look at the distribution of the links. And so it turned out, you know, a lot of the trips are less than a half a mile, the predominant number. And we'll see some of those percentages as we uh, go through the, the different tabulations that we made to figure out these comparisons. And then for, uh, we looked at the, the mile trips, the lengths in miles, and, and then we came up with an average trip distance. So the average trip distance is very short, only about one mile in Birmingham. And when we move on to look at the same type of comparisons in Mobile, we see it's only about, uh, so over 95% of the use was for e-scooters and less than 5% for bikes e-bikes. And so uh, that kind of uh, really probably invalidates our comparison to e-bikes, but uh, nevertheless, we, we went through the calculations and we see that the, the distances were both less than, than a mile. But, but what also what we're seeing is the amount of mileage and the number of trips that are being taken out of cars, maybe that would have been alternates to this uh, mode of travel in the inner, inner uh, part of the city. And then that it certainly is a benefit of the micro mobility systems. And then this just gives a summary of the, the number of vehicles that were uh, in operation, the total trips, the total miles, and just summarizes the difference. So for both uh, cities, the mileage was less, was uh, no longer than a mile, a little over a mile for Birmingham for the e-scooters. So this was kind of surprising. I expect people to take longer trips than this, but uh, but it turns out that wasn't the case. They were turned out to be very short trips. So certainly some of these trips, maybe you could argue, are replacing walking trips, maybe. I, I, don't, I don't know. Uh, so that, that would be one of the kind of surprising findings that we had from our study. And then another part that we uh, included in the next slide was that we began to look at the physical activity benefits of e-bikes. And this just provides a background of that we know that there is a lot of physical inactivity in, in our country and, uh, and that the, the low levels of physical activity are continuing to rise. And there's all kind of negative health benefits as a result of that, that we see uh, uh, public health officials and people in the physical activity field beginning to look at, beginning to look at the geography. And one of the conclusions that has come from this work has been that uh, urban sprawl has led to decreased public health in our country. So transportation is something that can, can make a contribution to that. So the next few slides just kind of lay out the argument that physical activity is important to, to citizens and to, to the communities for well-being, for cardiovascular fitness, and for mental health. And then we see the type guidelines that are published by the National Physical Activity uh, 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 program on how much physical activity you need to have to meet their requirements and, and that half of the adults in our country don't meet them. We know that healthcare costs are rising and well-being and watch news of, of all the things that happen in our country, that well-being is declining as a result of this. And so replacing uh, short car trips with active travel uh, is, a, is a remedy that physical activity and public health officials are saying is a a treatment for increasing physical activity and improving overall health. So that leads us to this common ground that we have in this study that commuting by bike increases physical activity. And then e-bikes, now when we insert e-bikes, the concern is how much do we give up uh, of the benefits of physical activity uh, but for the fact that they have, uh, that they're powered by, uh, by an engine or by a motor. And so this was the concern that was studied but uh, it does have some benefits that it broadens the number of people that would use bikes that's less, who are less physically fit and maybe less ably bodied individuals. So uh, they're easier to use. Uh, however, they still are physically engaging. You, just, you still pedal and they do provide cardiovascular health. 
So, so the number four is kind of the biggest takeaway that, so to have a similar amount of physical activity on an e-bike, you would have to ride further, ride longer um, than conventional bikes. However, substituting sedentary travel modes uh, still produces uh, positive physical activity outcomes. So here's what we did. So this was our colleague, uh, uh, Dr. Morgan Huey from the College of Charleston and her students. They made a comparison through a participant study, was conducted here in Charleston, had 15 participants. Um, then they, they went through a selection process. They measured stuff in the laboratory setting related to people's health. And then they assessed their, uh, their uh, fitness levels through uh, ergonometers and other kind of measures. And then they went and had a field data collection on a test mile track, one mile in a local park, Hampton Park, actually right uh, just adjacent to the Citadel campus. And the 15 participants rode instrumented bicycles, a regular bike and an e-bike for one hour. And then the study comparisons looked at how far they traveled, how fast they traveled, and what were their heart rate and other uh, participant uh, perceptions. So in the next slide, we have the, the uh, kind of the findings from this. So. Uh, so e-bikes, they were, this is a one mile track that they went around that has uh, automobile traffic, but it's primarily a, a park setting with a bike lane and a pedestrian lane as well. And they were out, able to travel uh, further, well, they, I should say first, they were able to have, operate at a higher speed, uh, about 40 something percent higher speed. They were able also to travel further, about 40 something percent further. And then they attained a good bit, good portion of the physical activity benefits of being on a bicycle, even though it was an e-bike. So, e so bicycles are more rigorous, obviously, to, to pedal, but you still get a lot of physical activity benefits from e-bikes. And then there were these perception uh, areas that were studied as well, just kind of Likert scale and the Borg scale, which is a physical activity scale, one through 20, looking at the uh, the perceived exertion exertion of, of the participants versus uh, uh, just what they felt versus what they uh, were actually measured the differences. And then kind of what their other feelings about their participation in the study were. So now we go to the kind of results of all this. Um, I think uh, Quaker oh, talk about this. Yeah, um, so in summary, uh, we just wanted to uh, highlight some of the findings. Um, so the, the system in a mobile uh, seems to have a lot more trips, a lot more mileage. Uh, the Birmingham uh, system uh, looks to be in competition with other systems that were um, in, in the area. So that uh, could uh, account for the low numbers uh, in usage. Um, but overall, uh, looking at the trips, uh, there were short trips, uh, less than a, a half a mile, um, almost over 90% were within two miles. So this is what Jeff was talking about. Um, what types of trips are they replacing? Are they replacing walking trips, um, especially the scooters? Or can these be substituted for a shorter car or a, a vehicle trips? So that's something, um, uh, hopefully that's what's happening uh, to reduce congestion. Um, so very few of these trips were over uh, two miles. Looking at it. Um, from a level of traffic stress standpoint, uh, Birmingham had a lot of their trips on a high level of traffic stress, a roadway setting, um, especially the e-scooters, uh, but that's what we were trying to point out. There were some were on, on um, sidewalks as well, so it was kind of hard to differentiate those. Uh, but Mobile uh, had uh, their trips at a, in a much more comfortable setting with um, LTS roads um, that were ones and twos at about 80%, so only 20% were on high stress roads. Uh, from the uh, physical activity study, um, the issue or some of the questions that are always asked were, how much do you lose or how much more physical, or how much physical activity do you lose by switching to an e-bike and not exerting yourself as much? But uh, the, uh, the findings were great to see that you still have about 87% of that exertion that you would have had on a traditional bike. And uh, Jeff can kind of add to this, I kind of take it from here. Um, 
Yeah, so this problem. was a, a, a interesting finding. So 80% of the, 87% uh, of the heart race intensity benefits in comparison to traditional bikes. And furthermore, uh, travel 43% faster or 40, 42% further over the test track that was used for the participant study. And that uh, the participants, you know, it's a small, small data set, but uh, preferred the e-bikes, you know, uh, substantially over traditional bikes for commuter trips, but not for recreational trips. Uh, that was that was a different category. So the kind of the the takeaway, I would say, some closing thoughts are just uh, that it's important that in the our field of transportation that we begin to look at physical activity, well-being of com communities. Lots of work has been done under the active living research funded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation that show and quantify all the benefits that we can uh, 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 achieve through uh, the design of our facilities and the, the form that our mobility takes. So I think that e-bikes, e-scooters, uh, and, uh, and bike share systems have a lot of potential to meet short distant trip demand in urban areas. And then they also would have health benefits and, and well-being benefits to our community. So this is a common overlap area between transportation and public health that I think bike share systems uh, can help meet, meet these demands. Obviously, one of the things that has happened, these uh, bike share systems have proliferated and, and in many cases, uh, very few changes have been made to the road network. So that is uh, something that we identified through the level of stress method um, uh, that helps you see we do need to make some uh, road network changes to better accommodate these travel modes uh, and, as we adopt the systems in our communities. And that, that concludes our presentation and you can enter any kind of questions that you have in the chat box and we'd be happy to answer them. And we really appreciate uh, people listening to our uh, kind of the summary of our research grant that we've had. And uh, we, we had a, a good uh, experience working uh, across fields. And I think this is a, a great area to include in all of the things we do in transportation engineering. Uh, that this It's great that we're including this part, this little niche area for short-term trips. For, uh, for questions as well, uh, you could also put it in the Q&A uh, section. And uh, please go ahead and fill the survey. Uh, I believe um, on Dean uh, put the link in. Uh, it will be great to get feedback on uh, how we're doing on the seminars and if there's any way we could um, make them better um, moving forward. Thank you. So we have a first uh, question here from Andy, Jeff, so I'll just go ahead and read it, if that's okay. Yeah. Uh, does the pricing for each device have an impact to the trip length or duration? The, the pricing was very similar uh, to for both of the systems. So uh, we weren't able to see that there wasn't a, a difference between the two that we could measure because the pricing was, was very close to the same cost like a dollar to to uh to use the vehicle and then it was 40 something cents or 38 cents per mile afterwards so i think the uh the pricing was relatively the same between the two systems thanks jeff um uh, next question is um so uh, this is from jay uh, jay maddox uh, well done i am a bit surprised at the results I wouldn't have thought the health benefits would be as closely aligned. Yeah, I think that was a surprising finding from the study. So, uh, you know, obviously we, you know, they documented very closely the types of vehicles that they tested. They were both from Gotcha and they were commonly used e-bikes versus their other bike share uh, bike that they had used in Charleston previously. So, uh, you know, it gave a, it's a, uh, gave a, a well-documented uh, comparison 
uh, but but that was on level ground, you know. So maybe if it was tested in Colombia or somewhere that had more terrain relief, then the uh, the differences might might have been greater. Pro probably would happen. So it was important to note that that was on level terrain. <laughs> Next question is, um, this is extremely interesting. Uh, where can we find the research paper? And I know Jeff's going <laughs> to. <laughs> yeah, so this is, this is uh, we're wrapping up the paper right now. And uh, it will be, and we're going through the review process and all that. And uh, it will be published on the Stride uh, f final uh, research uh, project website. And then you can go and see any of the projects that have been uh, conducted through the, the Stride uh, Region 4 USDOT UTC are published on the um, on, on their website and you can find all the studies there. And this one will be there shortly, but it's not there quite yet. But you can reach out to either me or Kwaku and we'd be happy to uh, share anything that we have, you know, the slides certainly. And, um, but this is be recorded and it's available for review. But the, obviously the, the final report will have the most detail in it. Mm -hmm. Uh, next question from Justin. Due to the higher speeds of e-bikes, should we look at using higher design speeds for the design of shared use paths? Um, are there any safety concerns with e-bikes mixing with um, on or mixing yeah, uh, with other bikes uh, on shared use paths with walkers and children, et cetera? I think I think this is a great question, Justin. Yeah, and, um, I uh, you know, like bike lanes are able to accommodate higher speed vehicles like e-bikes better than separate paths. And uh, the one thing that we did see in the study that was really more focused towards um, e-scooters, it was in Mobile, uh, it was that they they were concerned about safety, but over the time of the operation, there had been I think only three kind of slight. Uh, small incidences of conflicts between pedestrians and the e-bikes operating on sidewalks, which which wasn't uh, allowed, but that didn't mean that's uh, they still operated on sidewalks. And uh, I think that that when we start looking at uh, shared paths, this is a, I think that 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 would be the design speed, uh, or maybe even posting a speed limit. Maybe would be. Uh, one, one of the keys here, which seemed kind of an odd thing to do, uh, uh, we have high speeds. We in our community, we have a shared bike path over the Cooper River Bridge, over the Ravnell Bridge, and there are some speed issues on that at time because of the slopes with regular cyclists. And and uh, I think uh, having some kind of uh, required maximum speed uh, would would be uh, would be helpful for people's safety, and that might be part of the solution as well. And um, I just to chime in, I, I think um, separating these modes would actually take away from the purpose of having these mixed use paths and multi use paths. So it's a uh, it's a conundrum, um, especially with the higher speeds, because um, you think you want to separate them, but then then you're going back to what's happening with uh, vehicles right now, like like um, automobiles and and pedestrians and, and uh, bikes. But that's what we're trying to avoid to create. Uh, um, a mixed use environment where we can kind of build community. And so again, um, yeah, that's a, a, it's a good question, but we don't have a, a good answer, I guess, a solution. Um, next question uh, from Nick. For e-bikes and e-scooters, these often require a repositioning overnight. Did you capture these vehicle trips generated to uh, reposition bikers or bikes and scooters and back them out of the trip replaced. Um, so this, I think we had some discussion on it. And I believe the dashboard removed um, all those kind of trips from their system because we talked about how about those very short trips where someone just picks it up and repositions the bike or puts it on, on the vehicle and stuff like that. And I. If I'm not mistaken from our discussion, um, it was that they kind of went through some monthly cleaning of the dashboard to remove those kind of trips. But we didn't do that on our side uh, in particular. We just used what the data was from the from the providers. 
Yeah, and then the, when we analyzed the, um, the GPS tracks, they had a user number attached to them. So that would be showing that a user, that somebody was using that, that had an account with uh, uh, the micromobility system. So that, uh, but, but cleaning that data was a lot of work because those, that, that is the key part of it is uh, trying to get the data to be consistent and to then attribute it to each one of the roadway segments uh, that that turned out to be a lot of work, and uh, Kwaku and uh, Safa from Georgia Tech spent a lot of time uh, getting the data to be uh, comparable and to and to clean the data to get out the, the noise out of it from that those very types of issues that you're mentioning there, Nick. Another question uh, from Nick: uh, Some cities are moving to carve out bike lanes adjacent to but separate from shared use paths. Uh, perhaps that might be the way forward to accommodate e-bikes and e-scooters uh, users without adversely impacting other shared use paths. Yes, I, I, I guess that's what I, I was kind of alluding to before, uh, Nick. Um, and, and again, that's kind of bringing more uh, a separation, but uh, safety is important. Um, safety is key, especially for pedestrians who are seeming to get the brunt of um, all of these other modes. Um, anything else you want to add? Yeah. No, I think that, the, you know, as we try to look at complete street design, then it would not just be one uh, size fits all, that we, we do have different uh, users and different uh, operational characteristics that would really put e-bikes more in, in the bike lanes and certainly get them off of the sidewalks. They shouldn't be usually Typically in, uh, in Charleston and I know many other cities, it's against the law to ride a bicycle on the sidewalk. I think that's uh, all we have right now for questions. We can just uh, wait a few more um, minutes on this. Undine has uh, anything else to add? I think this has been great. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the great questions and thanks to everyone who joined and uh, really uh, appreciate the support to uh, come and listen to about our research grant and we're working on other ones, but this is the one we are wrapping up now. So uh, it's been great to work uh, through the USDOT, UTC Region 4 with the University of Florida and the Stride Center and, uh, and the Citadel has uh, had a lot of great benefits by being affiliated with all the universities in, the, in this consortium and, uh, and continue to try to do good work that uh, helps our field and uh, benefits the, our state as well. So thanks. So for we do me. have one more question uh, before we wrap up with uh, what's coming up uh, next in the series. Um, it's an anonymous user. Uh, will bicyclists eventually have to pay, pay towards roadways due to all the upgrade dedicated to bike routes and bike lanes um, and in brackets like vehicle registration and driver's licenses. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. That's a very uh, overarching question. I think for these uh, mobility as a service, you know, the, the, the types of fees that they pay could, could you know, in, in theory, there need to be road improvements to better uh, get the value out of the, uh, the micromobility systems. And so, those fees could be part of the what what those businesses pay, and those fees get passed on to the users of the micro mobility service. But brought more broadly for cyclists, I, that's a very interesting and I think complex question to figure out how uh, bikes would be uh, would be pay pay for the infrastructure. I think right now the, the part that we focused on is like how do we uh, free up some of the congestion that would occur related to short distance trips to allow more efficient use of the roadway network and the capacity of the roadway network, mostly by automobiles. All right, so that exhausts our, our questions list. Uh, we had a few more chimes, but I think it was the same question twice. And uh, thank you um, as well, Anne. Uh, uh, Anne said thank you for the presentation. Uh, so this is um, the last slide um, is talking kind of pointing us to the next few uh, webinars uh, coming uh, coming up um, October 5th 
October 12th and October 18th. I, I, I'm sure you, you, you get a lot more information. Um, as the time nears from Undine um, on these. Yes, thank you very much. We have a link in the chat box to registrations for those future webinars. And if you haven't already, please complete our very short survey to help us prepare for future webinars. Thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you so much to our two speakers. This was a really great topic, very timely and really interesting. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.